you, Brother Given, for those kind words. I've been around a little bit uh, wandering, doctrinally, uh, and uh, it's amazing that even you found that hard to really put that into words, whatever they have been through. Consider the kind of meat I've been getting as I've been sitting out here among you, taking in these wonderful messages from God's Word, and just having my soul fed tremendously. <coughs> my topic, or our topic, let's put it that way, because this isn't a sermon, uh, this is a discussion. That means I need your help. Uh, our topic is man's identity with God in Jesus Christ. When Brother Gibbon first sent me those words through the mail and said this is the discussion topic, I looked at that and I thought, wow, that is huge. But this whole theme of, of this conference is a large theme, the knowledge of God. Every message uh, has had to deal with the largeness of the subject. The more I thought about this, man's identity with God in Jesus Christ, the more I realized that topic is as broad as the Bible, as deep as the Bible, as wide as the Bible, at least starting with Genesis chapter 3, at least there, from there on, clear through the end of the book of the Revelation. there in Genesis 3, you have that uh, promise, Genesis 3.15, after Adam and Eve had uh, lost their former blessed estate in the garden, had listened to the uh, temptations, the temptation of Satan, and had followed his way, and they were cast out, God uh, quickly gave the promise. Sometimes called the proto gospel, the first mention, the first hint in the Bible anywhere of a gospel, mm -hmm. of, a, of a message of good news for the human race. Of course, it wasn't needed up till that point. From then on, there was a tremendous need for a redeemer, someone who would defeat uh, thoroughly, completely, absolutely Satan. God made that promise in Genesis 3, 15. From there on, God's word brings us what is often referred to as the scheme of redemption. That means there is a righteous God who has been offended. He has been disobeyed. He has been sinned against. And those who have done that of the human race are called sinners. And we've learned from the scripture that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all are shut up under sin and all are in need of a redeemer. And God provided that redeemer. He gave the promise in Genesis 3.15 as you go on through the uh, Old Testament as most all of you know that promise is enlarged, it's, it's developed, it's worked out, it's uh, expanded upon tremendously in the prophecies as Brother Waters uh, so wonderfully brought to our attention this morning uh, until we get to the time, the fullness of time. When, uh, as Paul says in Galatians 4, 4, uh, God sent his son into the world, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those. So you have that scheme of redemption. Now, I take it that that is a good part of what our discussion is going to be about. When I thought of man's identity with God in Jesus Christ, I also thought of another side of it, and that is God's identity with man. Amen. 
Amen. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure, Brother Given, sometimes if maybe I'm following that side of it more than I am the other side. But uh, I want you to feel free if, if I haven't developed it really, uh, if I've left out something that you think you would like to see brought out, feel free to uh, insert that information. Uh, one of the great Old Testament prophecies of man's identity with God in Jesus Christ is that Isaiah 7, 14 passage. You'll recognize that that passage is quoted in Matthew 1, 23 in the New Testament at the birth of our Redeemer. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So someone would be born to a virgin, and that one would be called Emmanuel, God with us. With us, lost sinners. There would be one that would be provided. The daysman, as Brother Waters mentioned this morning. In John 1.14, well, John 1, 1, and then verse 14. You have that great passage of scripture on the incarnation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then many beautiful truths in between, but on down to verse 14, and that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, there is, uh, in one sense, God's identity with man. The Word. The Word was God, but the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I can't comprehend that. I believe it with all my heart. It makes sense to my heart, but I, I cannot comprehend how it could be, but it, it was so. This marvelous thing happened. The Word became actually one of us. Yet without sin. Yet without sin. Amen. Amen. 1 Timothy 3.16 also speaks of Jesus <coughs> as God manifest in the flesh. So here you really have God going to the really unimaginable degree of seeking to identify with man and to have us identify with him by going to this degree of actually the Incarnation being manifest in human flesh. Now without the Incarnation, there's just no Gospel. Now I realize that, that isn't the whole Gospel. There are some religious groups, some, some denominational groups that really elevate the Incarnation to just about the sum total of the Gospel message. We don't want to do that, but certainly without that, there would be no gospel. Amen. Amen. In, John, in uh, Romans 5, 1 and 2, mm -hmm. we uh, are told that we gain access now from our lost estate. As lost sinners, we now gain access into the grace of God, which is salvation. We gain access into through faith in Jesus Christ. He's the doorway. He's the access gate through which, through whom we go uh, back into fellowship with God from our lost estate, our lost position. And very similar to that, Jesus himself said in, in that uh, upper room discourse, John 13, 14, 15, 16, I, I think that's some of the richest teaching in all of the Bible about the Christian life, directly from the lips of our Lord himself in that upper room the night before he was uh, betrayed, the night of his betrayal, the night before his crucifixion. He shared some new, up, up to that point, new and uh, wonderful spiritual truths with his disciples in that upper room. But he said that uh, I am the way the truth and the life. And 
and no man cometh to the Father but by me. And Paul explained it just a little bit different, but really not different, just different words in Romans 5, 1 and 2. That it is through Christ and through faith in him that we have access into the grace of God. Now, uh, formally speaking, when does, when does that happen, though, in the life of any one particular sinner? At what point, according to New Testament teaching, is someone brought through that access door to where they say, I know that I've come through that door and I'm now standing in the grace of God. I think that uh, the teaching of the New Testament is quite clear on that. Amen. What I'd like to do is read from the Amplified Bible here. Um, I don't always agree with the way the Amplified New Testament fills out the verse. But I think in this case, it's done a very accurate job of bringing us some real insight as to that point at which a person, a lost sinner, comes from darkness to light, moves from an estate of lostness to a, an estate of grace and salvation, and has gained access into God's grace. And I'm going to read from Colossians 2, 11 and 12. Now, bear in mind, this is the Amplified Bible, so you know what that does. It, it takes some of the words and it fills them out a little bit and does a little bit of explaining with it. So it's a, it's a touch of a commentary, really. But I think in this case, it's uh, pretty good. And in many cases, really, but I think it's pretty good in this case, for sure. And uh, Colossians 2.11, In him, that is in Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands, but in a spiritual circumcision performed by Christ by stripping off the body of the flesh, which does not mean the physical body, the whole corrupt carnal nature with its passions and lusts. Thus you were circumcised when you were buried with him in in which you were also raised with him to a new life mm -hmm. through your faith in the working of God as displayed when he raised him from the dead. Mm -hmm. Formally speaking, in the life of any particular one lost sinner, according to New Testament teaching, the Apostles' Doctrine, this is when we gain access through faith. And it's important to realize, and I, I would think most of us do realize this, it's important to realize the part that faith plays in this, though. You know, sometimes we're accused of, uh, in New Testament Christianity, of holding to water regeneration or water salvation. And uh, sometimes we see evidence around us, if we're really open about it, that that is, at least in some people's minds, that within our fellowship, what we're supposed to be thinking. But uh, you'll notice here that baptism is the occasion, baptism is the time when we pass from darkness to light. Mm -hmm. But it, he, goes, he says here that uh, in which you were also raised with him to a new life through your faith in the working of God mm -hmm. as displayed when he raised Christ up from the dead. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, baptism is the time when, but it, it isn't just the, the getting in the water and coming up out of water. It's, it's the time when we call upon the name of the Lord in whom we come to believe in our hearts that he has been raised from the dead, that he is the Lord, and that we're calling upon him now in this act to save us and to wash away our sins and to take them under his blood. Now, this is part and parcel of the scheme of redemption. And God is the one who has set this up. This is uh, God seeking man to, to restore us, 
to himself back in the fellowship with him. Uh, another very, very important uh, passage of scripture. Some would say the locus classicus. I guess that's how you say it. I've heard a little bit of Latin up here, so I thought I'd throw some in there too. Uh, I've heard ad infinitum, and I've heard, uh, what's it, oh, sine qua non. Well, here's locus classicus. Is that one? Is that right? <laughs> Maybe that isn't even right. But anyway, that means it's one of the main texts the main text you would use. And there I'm referring to Romans chapter 6. The 6th chapter of Romans. Where we are buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. And we're identified with him in this. So that we are not just to think of ourselves as, uh, well, I've been baptized now, I've joined the church now. We're to think of it not so much in that term, those terms as I have identified with Jesus Christ. Amen. I have identified with the new life that he came to give. I've been raised up now, not just to enjoy the forgiveness of my past sins, but to walk in newness of life. Mm -hmm. And it culminates there in Romans 6, 11, uh, Reckon yourselves, therefore, to be dead unto sin, mm -hmm. but alive unto God mm -hmm. in yeah. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I've done a very good job of, of explaining this, but I'm trying to pull all these threads, kind of throw, pull them together here, in the scheme of redemption as uh, what the Bible is all about. God seeking man, man's identity with God in Jesus Christ. The result of that is, according to 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4, that we become partakers, then, of the divine nature, which is absolutely astounding. I mean, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, He indwells us, and through that, we actually, us lost sinners, now we can become partakers of the divine nature. We're baptized into the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Not just in the name, but into the name. Mm -hmm. Amen. And there's a relationship that takes place there. Having, uh, by baptism, one is actually by faith spiritually incorporated into the Godhead. Amen. You recognize that, Brother Fred? Amen. You said that once. <laughs> I got that from something you wrote. I thought that was so good I couldn't improve on it, so I wrote it down. But I thought I'd give you the credit for it. Because it's true that uh, in this scheme of redemption, we are identified with Christ through Him, through faith in Him, and through obedience to the gospel. We are made, we are reconciled unto God. Now I have all kinds of scripture written down here, but what I want to do is, I didn't come up here to preach a message. This is a discussion time. So I want to give you an opportunity to, to get in on this and uh, to share what thoughts you have on this theme, man's identity with God in Jesus Christ. All I have said so far is to get us started. I'm sure there's a lot more to be said in different ways and in very good ways. So I want to invite you at this point to uh, get in on the discussion and make the contribution. Um, I like what Brother Gibbon said one time, as I heard him say it somewhere, and that was that there's no one person in the body of Christ that has all the truth. Not, not the preacher, not an elder, not a couple of elders. But it is what God has given all of us to see from His Word. As we share that, we edify each other, and uh, we leave strength in the truth. So Amen. this is your turn to share with us what the Lord has shown you about this theme, man's identity with God in Jesus Christ. I just try to touch very briefly on the doctrinal aspect and the experiential aspect. Let's fill that out in our discussion here. There's so much more to be said, so. Now, today, you do not have to come forward. If you want to, you can feel free. You can come down here in the front, but I found out from the sound man that uh, your voice can be picked up from just about
about anywhere in this auditorium. So you may stand right where you're at, or you may come forward, whichever you'd like to do. We have somebody that would like to share some insight with us on this great theme. Okay, brother. I may not remember everybody's names. I'm Jim Robinson from Milton, Florida. In my study of the scriptures, I've tried to place myself in the beginning. I've tried to place myself as one of those Jews that was told by Peter that I had just crucified my Lord. And when I see the response to his preaching, my question is, Paul wasn't there at that moment to give us Romans. And none of those Romans had been written. And Peter, when he's recorded, didn't deliver all this eschatology that you've just gone through, we've been going through. My question is, if those people could respond and identify this Jesus and do the things that they did, isn't it possible that in our eschatology and all of our hermeneutics and all of the other things, we've missed something. We've missed the, the essence of salvation in Christ, and that's all they knew. And yet they took off like a house of fire and won the world for Christ. We have developed all of these knowledgeable things, and I'm not putting down the New Testament, but the problem is uh, somehow or other we've lost our enthusiasm for going out and winning the world for Christ. We can argue with one another about this, that, and the other, but we can't seem to get out of the pew and get into the community. Uh, I'm concerned about that. Well, you know, my thought on that is we certainly, uh, we certainly don't have a perfect uh, apprehension of of the full truth. Uh, and there's more to learn for all of us. And it's certainly true also, brother, that uh, we, we uh, need more application to soul winning, to evangelism. Um, I can agree with you on that. I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody else has some perspective to share on that. Anybody give them? Yes, I'd, I'd like to say something now. Uh, about that. The, the situation is uh, a bit different now than it was on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the day of Pentecost caught the devil unawares. He, uh, he thought that he'd won the, won the battle. He, the devil's not omniscient. He's really not. And uh, at that day, he lost you know, a sizable number of uh, his lieutenants, you might say. Just in a, just a rather, rather short period of time, these, these people, their, their entire view of Christ was dramatically altered. And uh, frankly, the devil was caught, on, caught unawares by this, by this situation. And it appears at this point, now this is, uh, this is my, my own view of this, is that he then launched an assault against, against the church to be cloud this remission that appeared to be so readily embraced. They gladly received the word. They went from house to house and continued daily in the temple and sold their possessions. And see, the, the, the reality of remission appeared to be very clear to them. And at once, as I see it, Satan goes to work to cloud this. And now uh, Paul, then he's facing this clouded environment, the situation that Rome wasn't like it was in at Jerusalem. It wasn't the same at all. Had, all of a sudden, the, the reality of remission had been clouded and they, their attention had been, had been diverted uh, to other uh, inco inconsequential things, actually. Everything from eating meat to self-indulgence to who's an apostle and who's not and things like this. And, and in my judgment, it's even worse now than it was then. It, he has increased uh, his attack so that the very thing that was crystal clear to those believers is the thing that is the least clear to the contemporary believer because of this, all of this barrage. 
And, and so, uh, along with what you're saying here, it's, we've, got, we've got to restore that clarity some way, and the only way that can be restored is to expound, those that see it, to expound this, this great gospel. That, and that's what Paul, in fact, did. You'll notice that in all of his epistles, uh, when he dealt with the problem, the first thing he'd do, he'd proclaim this gospel from, from different vantage points, and he could turn the light on, and then in the light he deal with the, whatever the the situation was. I, in my opinion, in the average church, whatever you know, whatever that means, one of the most dangerous things that could be done is to send them out into the community mm -hmm. to win souls. I, they don't have anything to say. You'd have to stock up your track rack before you send them out. Because really, if you have to tell them to go out, you better lock the door and keep them in. Nobody told them to go out. In fact, the world persecuted them and hounded them and scattered them abroad and <laughs> they couldn't shut the thing up. Now what, uh, it seems to me that if the gospel is really seen like it is, it, it will have the same effect that it had on Amen. at the day of Pentecost. Amen. And that, Brother Jim, that will happen. Mm -hmm. When the gospel is seen like it is and embraced, that will be duplicated again. I appreciate that, uh, Brother Gibbon. I, I had agreed with you know, uh, a good bit of your thrust there, but I felt something needed to be said, and I'll tell you something great. Well, what I was referring to really is the fact that if you look in Luke, uh, the last chapter, and uh, Verse uh, 27. Jesus himself taught. And he said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Mm -hmm. And then again, in verse 44, he said to them, That's what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled as written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. There was adequate information available for those people. To enthuse them to win the world for Christ. Uh, it's not adequate for us, apparently. We need more. And I am, I agree. Uh, if, if you don't at least know what you're doing, you ought not go out and mess up, you know, that kind of thing. So I agree there. But my question really alludes to the fact is, what do we do to train ourselves to go out and do what we're supposed to do? Well, that's a good question. Uh, there's certainly a place for that. I, I, my perception is that's a little bit different than the discussion, um, actually, here. But that's, that's a good, that's worth discussing. Certainly is. But uh, it's a little bit going away from the thing, the way I, I perceive it. I think what we do to, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but what we do to arm ourselves to be able to do what he's talking about is exactly what we're
who would be the Messiah who would come and restore all things. The daysman, the almsman, the, the one who could reunite God and man in a real way, who could fully participate in both natures. Mm -hmm. And in Jesus we have that. That's right. There are two words that are significant to the believer. One is only begotten. The only begotten of the Father. The other is firstborn. Mm -hmm. yeah, amen. The firstborn from the dead ones. Mm -hmm. That's us. Before we came to God through Jesus Christ. The dead ones, the ones out in the streets, in the world. We need a sense of what God has called us to. He's not called us to be just better people. He's not called us to just be, as C.S. Lewis said, nice people. He's called us to be of a, the very character that he intended for the first man and woman to have. In <coughs> God's own nature, now how he would have done it if there had never been sin, we're not told. But what we're told that in Jesus Christ, it is going to be so. <coughs> Incidentally, the word firstborn and and only begotten are not the same word in meaning at all. One is that representative of God to man, the only, the monogenes, the unique one. The second, the firstborn, the prototokos. We all know that as the word from which we get prototype. That's not just a rare specimen of someone who has been perfected. But that's the beginning point of a whole new order. And that's Jesus Christ. In, in Philippians, the second chapter, where it says that, you know, being equal with God, he didn't count that equality with God a thing to be held on to or more literally grasped. The first sin was Satan seducing man to try to climb up to God and grasp divinity in his own power. We see it again at the Tower of Faith. Mm -hmm. And we see that confounded in every instance. Mm -hmm. But Jesus Christ laying aside that which would have made him able to hold on to divinity or to grasp it in his own strength by being fully conformed to man and fully obedient to God in every way, therefore, I mean, even to the point of death, God highly exalted him and gave on him the name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus, and so on and so on. In the book of Hebrews, we see our man in heaven, one who is fully man, when he quotes there in the second chapter of Hebrews from the eighth psalm and says, What is man? What is man? That you're mindful of him. That you put all these things, everything that's created under his feet. He goes on and quotes the whole thing. He said, We don't see it now, but we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor. So that in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that the pioneer, the one who goes ahead, the archivist, the one who goes ahead, that he should be made perfect, the one who could say after his resurrection, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's true. He, in his manhood, had become identified again with God, so that it is complete, the descent and the ascent, and to the extent that we trust him, the extent that we stake everything that we have upon the reality that he is the only begotten and the firstborn, then the symbolism of, that Brother Irwin pointed out this morning, the symbolism of the sacrifice, of the transference of identity, becomes a reality in us, not just a symbol.
raised to the right hand of the Father. Uh, the great truth in, in the book of Ephesians of the believer's identity there, raised up with him and seated in the heavens. Even now, the positional truth spiritually about the life of every believer, we have that privileged position because of our identity. I think much of our, I think I know that much of our procedure and whatever you want to call it, evangelism or witnessing for Christ, will depend upon our analysis of the situation in which we're confronted. We're confronted with a, a mass of churchianity out there, people who confess faith in Jesus Christ, who belong to something they call the church. Protestantism, I don't doubt the list of the so-called Protestantism, the vast majority of whom, in my considered opinion, are personally alienated from the life of God. Now that's, I know the final size is up to the Lord, and I'm glad it is. I know this is just a tentative appraisal. I have to make some form, some preliminary conclusion or assessment of the situation before I'll know what to do with my sheet. And that is my considered assessment. The vast majority of the nominal church are alienated from the life of God. They're mm -hmm. not being generated. They're living and operating in the flesh, which means they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Bible says. That's, that's right. That's right. right. That's, right. Yes. that's what the Bible says. Now, that being so, we will have to formulate our procedure in view of that, in that situation. I think one of the errors of, of the Christian church in our time and its education institution is this church growth idea that has been adopted by a large number of them. Uh, as I understand it, the, the object is to go out and plant new churches. Plant new churches here. I don't think we need more new churches as the, the term is generally considered conceived of today. It says of the Jerusalem brethren, and here's a pattern. We've, for two centuries, we've taught that the Jerusalem church was a pattern church, and I accept that, and it's a good application by the faith of the reservation. But it said of these people who are directly uh, led and overseen by the apostles of the Lamb, and forget that, the apostles were in charge of the Jerusalem church. And they were all scattered abroad, except the apostles who remained there. And it says that they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They didn't go everywhere establishing churches. Now it's true that uh, that no doubt was the byproduct of ultimately, but that was not the objective. They did not go out to establish congregations. That's right. Amen. They were burning with a message of a risen, glorified Christ. Amen of whom they had become aware through the Holy Spirit by their obedience to the gospel. And they went out to share their faith with the lost world. Amen. That's, the, uh, that's the element that's been lost Amen. today, brethren, in the church. Amen. We're trying to establish some more denominations and do a greater hierarchy. Forget about it. If you have not participated in the risen life, you don't have anything to share. Amen. It's worth sharing. And I insist when you have, you, they, they can't stop you now. <laughs> we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. Amen. Amen. The apostle said, what we need to do is to get some life in the nucleus right. of the church that we have, and you won't have to worry about the sharing. They, 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 well, you just can't. When you, when, you, when you have participated in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't keep quiet. Amen. So that's, uh, that's my point of announcement. Let's, let's get ready. We ought to work on this to, to, to generate by God's grace some life in, in people, and this is a good beginning we have here, and send them back to their local congregations uh, to, to bear testimony of that which we have seen and heard. Mm -hmm. That's God's remedy. That's God's, uh, and the church organization, the church itself is going to take care of itself. That's a routine. That's not the main objective. The main objective is life. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ with them. Uh, and then he, you know, he was walking among the churches back in the last account, one of the last accounts we had on him, and in the Revelation, and he was there in the midst of the seven churches, and he's in the midst of his people today as they're committed to him, and as they carry forth and go, and go forth in his name, I like what he said there in Revelation of himself, conquering and to conquer. Amen. 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 Thank you. Brother Brent. You need to be a little more forceful in your presentation and <laughs> more enthusiastic. I'm lost on that.
ritualistic uh, discipline of the institution. Uh, we don't need any more beasts. We've got enough. We need uh, joy and peace that passes understanding, which comes from hearing the, the shepherd, the great shepherd of our souls, Jesus Christ, and nothing else. signification of that occurrence as Mr. Sister referred to it. When Christ died, the veil in the temple was a very heavy doctrine, you understand. I've read the dimensions of that, 18 inches, 13, something like that. You kind of kind of vary that. And it was meant to thus signify. Paul oh, interprets this part, and I'm not sure my eyes are guess about it. That the way into the holiest of all was made manifest. Bless mm -hmm. God, we have we now have access to God. We don't we don't have to go through any anybody except the mediator, Jesus Christ. We have access to God. The veil has been torn asunder, and we're invited to draw nigh in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You might say, Well, does everybody know that? Well, maybe they know it's in the Bible, but a lot of folks don't know. But knowing that, knowing that it's in the Bible and knowing it in your heart and, in, and practicing it in your experience are two different things. We're told, let us draw an eye to God. We, that's, that's an overwhelming consideration. We have access, free and untrammeled, uninhibited access to God. The veil has been rent asunder and torn away. Uh, and the way into the holiest of all is open. To me, that's the most overwhelming thought that, 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 that costs my soul, that I have access to omnipotence. Amen. To Amen. Jesus Christ. But I said, what are you going to do? Well, there's plenty of use to which can be put. <laughs> there are plenty of uses for a, in, in line with the purpose, the eternal purpose of God in Christ. There are plenty of utilitarian, plenty of utilitarian employment for this access. So let's, let's avail ourselves of the access and then go to work
the union is ordained by God then between not only man and wife at the ceremony there, but also in our union with Christ. As you well mentioned, Brother Phil, in Romans 6, we're buried with him. And we, praise God, are also risen with him. And shall be in its fullness also. Uh, husband and wife uh, share a name. I think that's very important. Uh, they share the same name. They, they wear the same mark. And they are known as being linked together. And that's something that certainly is lacking in certain areas that those that, that wear the name of Christ wear it on their heel rather than on their shoulder. They don't make it an obvious thing that they wear the name of Christ. Uh, husband and wife share goals. Their purposes are the same. It's the same thing in Christ. What is Christ's goal for us? We want to know God's will for my life. This is his will, even your sanctification. Amen. And there are many verses like that, but your goals are the same. That's identity with Christ. Uh, husband and wife share daily life. Eating, drinking, living together. You're in the same house. That is the same thing with us in Christ now. That's part of our identity is that we, we eat of his flesh, we drink of his blood, we, we taste of his sufferings. We also taste of his triumphs mm -hmm. through us, and he tastes of ours through us. There's such an inner working that you you can only say as Paul did, I am I am crucified to the world and into me. It is no longer I but Christ that lives in me. Right. And and also in short, that we share with Christ destiny. As a man and wife share the same destiny, so also do we that are now linked with Christ share that same eternal destiny. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brother Dave. And so what I what I kind of sum up there is uh, the a difference between the covenants the, under the new covenant in Christ, the depth and the intimacy of the relationship, uh, likened them to husband and wife. Is one very large difference in the covenants, and their their closeness, the intimacy, speaks of identification in Christ with God. Brother Martin, I think that to me the intimacy, the greatest intimacy that we've shown has been shown here, and it's shown throughout the New Testament scriptures. And I'm just beginning to realize that I was reading the sermon. On
is reciprocity. That is when God speaks. Not, not, it's just that we, that we don't just hear, it's most delightful. In fact, we are concerned if he doesn't speak. Amen. You know, the psalmist on one occasion said, keep not silence. Well, that, that, but he was just one person. I mean, he rose above his peers. And this wasn't the cry of the normal person, but it is the cry of the average son of God. Yes. Don't Amen. keep silence, Lord. We, mm-hmm. we delight, delight when, you, when you speak. Uh, and, and another thing about this identity with the... Uh, but one other thing, there's there's movement. I see a lot of people, much like Lazarus. You know, Lazarus, he was dead for a long time. Jesus, four days. Jesus stepped to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Good thing, you know, he said, Lazarus, the whole countryside would have emptied out. <laughs> now, I said that the scripture is very careful to point out that he was wrapped hand and foot with a napkin around his face. That's the way he come on. I about figured he probably hopped out. I, I've wondered how he how he got out of there. One brother Seth Wilson said he figured he levitated. I don't know whether he did or not, but it, it must have taken some effort to get out of there. And he said, oh, he can't see. He's got life now, but he's got napkins around his head. He can't see. His feet are bound up. He can't walk. His hands are bound up. And the first thing Jesus said was, now Jesus didn't do this. He didn't say, stand aside, folks. I'll just, you know, Speak these rats off. Huh? You just fall off. He probably could have done it, I guess, but he said, Loosen and let him go. Amen. 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 That's how I see what our ministry is. I see lots of folk hopping. They're, you know, they're alive. They're out of the grave, but they're hopping around. Well, I was going to say about this identity with God in Christ that now, here's uh, where we depart from earth wisdom. In the earth, any time you pass through a filter, you dilute something. Any time you go through, you lose something. That, that's the way it is in earth, whether you're talking chemistry or whatever you're talking. When you pass through something, you lose something. You dilute something. But when we are identified with God through Christ, we lose nothing. We gain everything. Now, here's the difference. is the Christ like a filter, here's where you pick it up instead of drop it off. See? In, in, uh, in Christ, you lose the flesh, but you pick up all the valuable material. So going through Christ doesn't diminish the relationship. It enhances the relationship. And that, that's, a, that's a marvelous thing. Total, totally unlike the, uh, unlike the world principles. Amen. Amen. All you filter out is the flesh. Amen. Well said. For the doubts? Sometimes our concept of the old covenant and the new covenant uh, is that the old covenant is 39 books and the new covenant is 27. And I taught that and believed that for many, many years. Then later I discovered that the Hebrew word covenant, the writ, and the Greek word diatheke has to do with a relationship. A covenant is a relationship of friendship. (coughs) And what God said through Jeremiah was that the day would come when he would renew his covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, the Israel is spiritual Israel, God's ecclesia upon earth today. God entered into a new relationship with man through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And it is in this, as Brother Irvin so aptly pointed out this morning, God said, I will remember their sins no more. I will be their God, they will be my people. So when we entered into this new covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ, our sins were done away with. They have been imputed to Jesus. And that is what the new covenant is. It is a relationship 
of friendship between God and man based upon the atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our judgment has already taken place in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And for that we should be thankful. Amen. 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 That's, That's, good good That's good news. That's good news. You know, when you're dealing with our identity with uh, God through Christ, it's kind of amazing. That's exactly what the Abrahamic seed covenant says. In the and in the seed, the all the earth be blessed. Mm-hmm. And of course, they were going to be blessed in that seed and become God's people. Uh, I just thought of the verse I want to go there in First uh, Corinthians 13, uh, the last three verses. You know, we talk about identity or not identification with. But, you know, Paul, of course, would remove the identification of the flesh. And he would say, now, all things are yours. You know, it's amazing to think we're pauper. You know, he said, all things are yours. Yeah. He said, whether you're Paul or Apollos, he said, or, or the world. And then he gave the basis for it. He said, and, and you're Christ. Christ is God. Now, he talked about being a child of the king and the midnight, too. But anyway, you know, all this is yours because of your identification of Christ and Christ's identification with God. Of course, to witness God is in Christ, we have to reconcile the world unto himself. In this beautiful context of uh, uh, Hebrews 2, that Brother Harold referred to a while ago, you know, so tremendous. And uh, uh, he comes on down, you know, and uh, of course, you know, he tasted death for every man and so forth. But, and he comes on down and, and he said, Now, uh, for which cause, he said, he's not ashamed to call him great. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, he said, You're my friend. So he's, he's our friend, but he says, for which cause he's not ashamed to call him brethren. And, and then look at this. He just almost exhorts something. He cries out and, and says, you know, behold, he said, you know, I and the children that thou hast given them. It's a really, you're really dealing with an identity with God in Christ whenever you, whenever you look at all that. Amen. Sparks thought, and thought shows life, and as long as we're on the ramp, we'll be all right. So, uh, Brother Marvin mentioned the, the fact of the relationship. The fact of the relationship is that Christ is the administrator of this great covenant. And so, if he be our uh, administrator, and so what we've seen from the old covenant to compare the two is we saw uh, a lengthy development of uh, a discussion and uh, not only discussion but uh, demonstration of divine intent, language, and whatnot. But in Christ, you see, it culminated and in him, seeing that he is the administrator of every good and perfect gift from God, according to James, then it takes less words to bring that across to us because it's more complete, it's more adequate, because everything in Christ that we have available, or what we have available in Christ, is, is everything that pertains to life and godliness. So therefore we can conclude that we have a more perfect sacrifice in Christ because it it requires less demonstration and uh, it's perfected in the sense that our understanding uh, is more complete and therefore we find the the prevalence of spiritual understanding take its place that we can spend more time in perfecting that rather than uh, worrying if uh, if we know him or not because Christ alleviates that stress because of the one problem that we had to deal with and that we couldn't deal with of our own virtue and that was our transgressions against the law but Christ appeared 
And uh, once law was taken away, we no longer needed that school match because we come under grace. Amen. And thereby, wherein we stand, Paul was even so assuming to say these words, that I am all that I am is by the grace of God. And this is another great way that we can identify with God in Christ because he now views us as his child and Christ, as his brother Martin mentioned, is our king and we reign as princes and if we endure even to the point of death, it's the worst thing they do to us if you're doing us a favor. Amen. But the worst thing they do to us is kill the body. They'd be doing us a favor otherwise. But when we shall receive our praises and God how marvelous that thought is to know that a time is coming where every man shall receive praise of God. Amen. Paul told the Corinthians, says, Know you not that the saints shall judge the world? It just shows you how intimate God desires to be in relation with us and the availability of it because less demonstration is called for and more uh, actual living can ensue. Amen. Amen. I like what Paul said, where grace was said about and grace did much more about. Mm -hmm. I like that too. <laughs> where I said it's rained unto this, so my grace ran unto righteousness, unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, if you're all like me, and I'm sure you are to some extent, I have problems remembering things in this uh, state of flesh and blood that I'm in. I thought it'd be nice to have a remembrance of uh, times like this. Say you're having uh, troubles on the job, the devil's throwing darts at you, or you're going through some trial or tribulation. It'd be nice to pull something out of your pocket to look at a list or something or a picture to remind you of what Brother Al said or what Brother, Brother Irvin said or something to give you power to get through that tribulation. And uh, right here it is. This is, this is something that, that we see regularly. I wish more people knew the power that is in this table right here. I think taking a no matter what the subject is on these forms that we have here, you're always going to have to come back to this sooner or later. Amen. Because this is the way God designed it. This is ordained this way that we cannot come to God by any other way than through Jesus Christ. There Amen. is no other way. Amen. It's His beloved Son in whom He is well pleased, and that's the way He wants it. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I think in Revelation there where uh, they brought out the book with the seven seals and John was there as a witness, and he saw that book, and I imagine it was pretty wonderful to look at, and he was probably very excited and anxious to see what was going to happen. They opened that book, and he, he wept, he said, because no one was worthy to open the book. And I imagine he wept sorely. Mm -hmm. And someone, as Brother Waters very well pointed out, we needed a mediator in the days, and someone who was both man and God, and you might think of Enoch, I used, to, I used to dabble with this when I didn't know any better, that Enoch was translated to heaven, the scriptures don't record any of his sin or anything like that, why couldn't he have died for our sins? He was perfect. Under the law of God, God commanded a perfect sacrifice, a lamb without spot or blemish. Why not Enoch, or maybe Elijah? He was also translated to heaven, but see, they... They only fulfilled, assuming even if they were perfect, which we don't know that, but they would have only fulfilled half the requirement. They were only man. They couldn't touch God, as Brother Waters said. Mm -hmm. Christ mm -hmm. was the sole unique candidate for the arbitration of our salvation. Mm -hmm. He was the only one. And, of course, you read on there in Revelation, Christ opens the book. Worthy is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So what, is, what does that mean for us? Well, we can approach the throne of grace with boldness. And in Christ, we are sons. 
this before we could we couldn't touch God at all. There was a great gulf betwixt us and Him, and we have been brought up to where where we can approach the throne of grace. Not we don't have to pray to some departed saint and, and send a message. We approach the throne of grace with boldness. We don't have to crawl up to it on our hands and knees and stick out a finger. We approach it with boldness. And this this is what gives us the power as Brother Al spoke about. This you don't need to pull up a list out of your pocket or something to get you through the rough times. This this table and the covenant written on your hearts is the power that will get you through these times. There's power in the blood. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Brother Mike, for reminding us of the Lord's Amen. table and uh, what that's about. Communion is sometimes referred to as communion or the communion service. But certainly our communion with Christ and through Christ with the Father speaks of our identity with the Father through the Son, through the shed blood. I have a friend one time, I was telling Brother Gibbon, a few years ago, he preached a great message called the So What of Baptism. And uh, you can do the same thing, I think, the Lord's table, the So What of the Lord's table, and develop that. Those thoughts for God's people. Mm -hmm. uh, they both speak of our identity with God through Christ in a very powerful way. I'll defer. Okay, I'll she's defer. He's defer. All right. Uh, in in Christ, we have a perfect picture of God of what God wants uh, concerning our subject, the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. We've spoken a lot of intimacy. We've talked a lot about uh, union, oneness, and in Christ, we have all those things. We have it in measure. He has it in full. But we are as he was in our measure. Mm -hmm. That's what God wanted. He didn't want God, one, one entity, man, another. He made us in his image mm -hmm. for this union and fellowship, this oneness, so that we are no longer men as we were before. We are new creatures mm -hmm. in Christ. He was God and man. And again, in our measure, we have become like unto our Amen. own Savior. That is the knowledge of God. We are no longer two entities, but one. Amen. 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 That's right. In our identity with God, there's death and life. Simultaneous. Death and life. Amen. Death to the world and life to God. Now, when Christ uh, came to redeem, redeem us, he laid his uh, divine prerogatives aside in Israel. He laid them aside. It cost him that to come here, and it costs us our earthly life to go there. Amen. So identity with God means a lack of identity with flesh. Amen. Amen. And uh, to, uh, to live with God, this is the absolute requisite. You die to the world. Amen. Jesus had to leave heaven to come to earth. And the fellowship with him, he had to leave earth. Amen. Then go to heaven. That's identity with God. It, it fell in there without collapsing into a matter of law. This, this is the only place where dying is pleasant. Right. Every time you lose some uh, of your earthly affections, and you are to mortify your members, not the other guy's members, mortify your members that are on the earth, it is a delightsome thing because God compensates the loss of, of uh, affiliation with this world, he compensates that with a with a gain advantage in affiliation with him. So mm -hmm. I would say identity with God uh, in this, involves his death and life relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me to die is gain. Mm -hmm. Can't be said anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
trust me and receive my nature in you. And at once, new life comes, my life, into your spirit. And eventually, in your body, your soul, and your mind, will be my fullness as well. Amen. 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 I thought I had one that but the key is not, not only, I don't mean that in a downplay sense, but I mean in addition to our advocate being among us, he is also in heaven for us as our great high priest uh, interceding yeah. on our behalf right now. That first the, the priesthood existed in the Old Testament, but it was pointing forward to the real priesthood that we are now privileged to be under the new covenant and to have our living high priest in heaven on our behalf interceding for us. Let's see a hand over for the bread. I would like to give you my version of the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, God gave the people the chance to save themselves by keeping his law. This you and I shall live. Don't do it, you'll die. It's an opportunity for self-salvation. The self-made man would really have the latter in the Old Covenant. The only difference was he'd been frustrated from beginning to the end. Now, the difference between, of course, that failed. That, it was determined, it was predetermined to fail. God didn't give the law to save anybody by it. I hope you understand that. Now. So the law was never given to save anybody. Amen. Amen. It was given Amen. to demonstrate to fallen man his complete inability to save himself and his complete dependency upon the, the, the God of all grace. That's what he was given for. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by grace. Now, grace is unmerited salvation. Mm -hmm. Unmerited favor is a classical, of course, definition of uh, grace. On the other hand, the new covenant, under the new covenant, God assumes all the provisionary responsibility for salvation. You don't have any at all. God has saved us in Jesus Christ. Salvation is by grace. God has God has done all the saving for you. He's relieved you of all the responsibility for your salvation. All you have to do is accept it. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Whosoever will, the Spirit and the Bride say come. Let him that hear us say come. Whosoever will, let come and take of the, my have prepared my dinner. <laughs> Bless Amen. God. But Jesus said, my oxen and my fat are were killed. All things are ready. Come to the feast. All you have to do is come and eat, come and die, come and die. Now that's the difference between law and grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Fred. Appreciate your insights very much. Sister June. Just a little on uh, something Brother Fred sparked. Under the old covenant, God said, come if you can. Under the new, he says, come, you can. Any other thoughts? From my watch, we still have time. We could go to four o'clock. Well, I can give you Yeah, under the law, we were enemies. The law dealt with enemies. It was a. Uh, it was the hook and the nose method. Yeah, I, I know people that actually believe you can go to heaven by hooking your nose. But you can't. <laughs> what would you do if you got there? <laughs> <laughs> See, heaven isn't going to change anybody's nature. Amen. Your nature's either changed here, or it isn't going to be changed. Amen. It isn't going to change anybody's attitude. Nobody's going to fall in love with God at the resurrection if they aren't in love with Him now. It isn't going to happen. See, so God, He can't save anybody that way. It, Deliberately, he made them that way. He had an innumerable company of angels like a flames of fire. He said, go, they go, come, they come. But he was looking for something a bit more challenging than that, and he found it in humanity. Now, what the law, what the law did, it dealt with aliens, and it, it hogtied them. Without the law, they just, they just went out into wickedness. One man uh, who 
who mistakenly is called a scholar, but at any rate, he, he, he likened the commandments of Christ to like a rope put on a cow, and if there's a stake in the ground, and the rope permits him a, about 20 foot radius. He can move around, and uh, see, that's law. Grace takes the stake out, takes the rope out, and puts the cow in a pasture that doesn't have any danger zones in the heavenly places. Yeah, under under the new covenant, there are no limitations, God. Amen. Amen. None Amen. at all. Amen. The, the veil's been written twain. You know, uh, Malachi talked about the windows of heaven. And John in Revelation 4, he said he saw a door for good heaven. <laughs> no more windows. <laughs> yeah, free access to them. Now that, uh, I... I haven't seen this all that long. It seems like it's been all my life, but it really hasn't been. But the thought of all limitations are earthward and question. Amen. Amen. With, with amazing consistency. But they were Godward under law. Mm -hmm. Tell the people not to touch them out. Put a fence around it. Keep them away. But here, now we come. Now Jesus, he comes, he says, come. But well, Moses said, stay. That's the difference between the law and grace. Amen. I remember uh, one thing that I've, I've heard a word <coughs> I've heard used a lot this afternoon in connection with uh, the New Covenant is life. Uh, mm -hmm. People who have come to know God in the way that the New Covenant speaks of mm -hmm. have life. Mm -hmm. I remember I read a book a few years ago. It's a devotional classic, and although it's written by a Puritan, so we probably wouldn't want to agree with everything in there. But the title of the book was uh, "The Life of God in the Soul of Man." Amen. And I think under the New Covenant, that is really brought out that the life of God is something that actually enters into Amen. the Amen. believer, the believer's life. We partake of the divine nature, and it, it occurs to me as I read the New Testament that one of the great differences between the covenants, the Old Covenant and New Covenant, is the place of the Holy Spirit. Bringing that life, as the Holy Spirit indwells us, bringing us divine life Amen. right into our, our souls. Amen. Amen. Giving us a new nature. Brother. The freedom I've found in Christ has given me the understanding that now I'm free to discipline myself to follow him. And it's a self-disciplining system. I can pick and choose all of the things that I want to do in Christ and go do them. Amen. Yeah, they were the doctor. You just commit yourself to the Lord Jesus and do what you want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason for that is run off what I would say that in the old, the righteousness that we were robed in was, was our own, is, or at least what we attempted to robe ourselves in, and the focus was on man. Now, in the new, God has said, well, you obviously can see that didn't work. You need some other robe. You need to be clothed with Christ's righteousness, which is perfect. And now, part of the problem is that we have the conflict of the natures that we have a body that's not yet redeemed. It's not. It's not purified. It's buffeted. And it's made our, our slave, and we keep it under us, as Paul would say, but it's not redeemed, and it can't be cleaned up, and it, and it won't be redeemed until the end, when we will have a body like unto his glorious body. But now, with that conflict, we have the righteousness of Christ, both upon us from a, uh, a heavenly viewpoint. God has said, you are partaking of the righteousness of Christ. You have these things. These are proclaimed. But now, we also have to work that out as Brother Jim mentioned and some others, about the application of these things. And I'm speaking of the personal nature, that you you see, for example, the Sermon on the Mount as both an indictment to your flesh and as an encouragement to your spirit. And this is the mark. These are just some, some uh, remarks that this is this is the mark. This is not the whole sum of the revelation, but this is a portion of it. And as we see these things, we see these as things that are, are now possible, that were not possible before. Another thing is, there's a difference between serving God and being righteous in appearance and being righteous throughout. Uh, you can always, I've never murdered anyone. I've never committed adultery. 
I've never committed fornication. So you can keep all these things on the outward appearance. But Christ took it so much further. He said a thought, a hateful thought, and you, you're you're under indictment. You're in a danger. So the man that calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire to think that it takes that much righteousness. Not the righteousness of a Pharisee. Not the righteousness of the keeping of the law. Though that is a start if you don't have anything else. You, you've got to at least be familiar with what God has said is required. But if, if that's all you have. The goal is to go to the point where any thought of wickedness is a foreign thought. See, our former times, thoughts of wickedness was the common thought, was the norm. Now we're at a point where any wickedness is an alien thought. It is not of us. It is of the sin that, that still dwells in our flesh. And we need to reject it and, and, and refuse it expression. Mm -hmm. Seeking that robe of righteousness that is Christ. Seeking to be like, as has been well mentioned, our elder brother in Christ, the pioneer who has blazed the trail to God and given us access to God. Amen. Amen. Those of us who have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Yes, amen. amen. And God is now at work in you to work, to will, to work according to His good pleasure. So let us work out our salvation here in heaven. See it. One of the reasons I'm so upset with our problem is that the statistics in the United States. There are about 85% of the people in jails throughout the United States claim to be Christians. There are precious few Jews, really a precious few Jews in the jailhouse. Because all over the land, when a Jew shows up in a community, they become family. And the family looks after them. And they immediately bring them up to a standard of living and a way of a job and a home and so forth that they become middle class citizens right quick way. And I'm trying to say that somehow or other we've got to get out of the pews and start loving our neighbors and loving one another and start it's good to have this knowledge of Christ and of God. I say it's good, you know, it's required but uh, there's more to it. Just that kind of knowledge, if you're still going to sit in the pews, uh, there's something you've missed somewhere. We've got to get out and move into the communities and love the people and find out what their needs are. Well, that, that's certainly true. That, uh, if we know God, we will want to make him known. I, I'm convicted of that. Want to make him, we want to see his name glorified upon the earth. Well, the scripture says, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. It didn't say it ought not to be hid. If we can get the people on the hill, you couldn't hide them if you tried. They couldn't, they cannot. That's what Jesus said. They cannot be hid. So I insist our problem is to get some life shining. Oh, get some life engendered in it. You can't have it. One thing, when we pray to our Father, <clears throat> sometimes we're surprised when He answers us, and we're surprised to our shame. When we pray to our Father, if we can go to Him with boldness and expectation that He hears us, and Jesus, if our thoughts are in line with His, then they're heard. And then, as far as our knowability with God, our uh, interactivity with him, we should have the same mindset. Because uh, to add to what Brother Fred said, if, not if, but when Christ becomes real to us, Amen. then he'll be real to others. And we, we kind of make this hokey. We make a, a hokey experience out of it rather than a personal experience of it. We sit around and wait for years uh, expecting uh, God to, to zap us when in actuality God has transformed us uh, when we died to self uh, and when we were buried with him and when we raised. It's just a natural phenomenon that the believer is different and that the believer does in fact promote the gospel 
without having a bit and bridle in his mouth. Amen. 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 But it is true, though, isn't it, is it not, that sometimes uh, we don't practice what we know. All of what we know. We don't practice our position. Well, I think sometimes we fall short of that. And then we're hiding our, uh, our lamp under our candle under a bushel. Yes, so that, let's go back to Bible language. We're hiding our, our candle under the bushel in Jesus' turn. Right. What that means is, is we don't know. If we don't show the light, then we're not of it. And if we do, we are. If we don't, we're not. That's that's what Jesus would say. He says, many will say in that day, did he say that? Many will say in that day, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we? He says, depart from me, I never knew you. See? That's, that's interesting. Anyone that doesn't have the evidence of uh, new life should question that he has it. Amen. 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 Yeah, he says, examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. That's one thing that is not taken for granted in the scripture. That's right. Is it a person's a believer? That is not taken for granted. He said, whose house are we if? And with the big if he had is something that hardly ever seen. If we have the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So even if you don't have it, then you have to examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. See, that's the whole point in question. <laughs> whether, you, whether you are or not. Uh, okay. Another distinction of covenants I was thinking on there. That, uh, God has not reduced his demands on mankind. That's not the distinction of the covenant. In fact, he is actually in priest. That's right. Grace is a much more of a disciplinary and, and law. Amen. Much more. See, under the under the law, you had a lot to do, but uh, it seemed like a lot to do, but no resource, and there was no provisions made for an error. Right. None. Now, in the new covenant, there's provision made for forgiveness. It says, oh, I'm writing this to you that you don't sin. That's, that's why I'm right. These things are right that you sin not. He didn't, and he didn't say, and when anyone sins. I don't even think the translation say that, which is quite a remarkable accomplishment. He said, if any man sins. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now that's something the, new, the old covenant did not have. That's right. It had no provision for, for infraction of the law. That's right. The new God. Amen. Amen. Brother Fred, I'd like to add one word. I'm talking too much. I know. I'm my weakness. <laughs> I'd like to add the last clause of that second Corinthians 13 5. Then it is for examine yourselves to see whether you be in faith. Know you not your own selves? Good question. That Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. Uh, reprobate. Of course, it takes you back to Isaiah. Reprobate. Reprobate. Sure. That's a reject. That's one something that is rejected. It's a reject by God. And let's do that. Examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith and the faith is in you. Know you not for your own selves that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobated with us. I trust that you know that we're not reprobated. That's a good point of self-examination. Either Christ is living in your hearts by faith or you're reprobated. Now that's what the Bible says. Amen. I think we're pretty much drawing down to being out of time at this point. Uh, we, there are many, many aspects of this to discuss. As we're, see, you can tell everything we're talking about in this topic is right at the very core of Amen. what it means to be a Christian. The Christian life, the life of faith. What, one thing that we didn't uh, get to, uh, I didn't really develop very much in my own personal study of this, was... Uh, our identity in the sufferings of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, there, that would be a whole other, we could probably spend an hour at least on that aspect of man's identity with God in Christ, talking about the suffering of the believer and the suffering of Christ. And God's involved in that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah.
I would like to close by reading a scripture uh, from, again, Colossians chapter 2 and then the first three chapters, the uh, first uh, three verses of Colossians chapter 3. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, Colossians 2, 9, For in him that is in Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Amen. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Amen. Amen. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Amen. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Amen. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen. Amen. Amen.